starting. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. We're recording. You're on the air. Take it away, Jason. All right. This sounds good. And uh, you'll have to excuse the fact that I am very new to Zoom. I'm on, are on to, to team. So I promise I will click all the wrong buttons and share all the wrong things. Uh, but let's Ooh. get started. Let's see. Let's go. Oops. I guess I should get the PowerPoint running first. We'll do silent hellos as, as Jason starts. Yes. Well, you want us to talk while you're presenting, Jason. Would you like? Oh, okay. We can do that too. <laughs> and, uh, he heckling questions are, are more than okay. I'm just fine with all of that. <laughs> all right. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Yep. Awesome. So uh, tonight we're going to do. All right. How long do we have tonight? Uh, four or five hours, or whatever. <laughs> No, but uh, we, we started you know, around 6.30 and uh, certainly try to end by 8.30 because we start losing people after an hour. Oh, yeah, I, I, I understand. I, I'll, start, I'll, start losing, I'll start losing attention in about five minutes, but I'll you know, endeavor to go, go on. Uh, so, yeah, let me, start, let me start. So this is actually a presentation that I gave at the South Florida Developers Conference back in, uh, back in February. Uh, have added some things to it since then. Uh, but, yeah, tonight we're going to do an introduction to Kubernetes with AKS. Um, I'm Jimmy B. I'm a senior solutions architect with Rancher Federal, uh, which is a spinoff from Rancher Labs that, lo lo that does work specifically in the public sector, focusing on military and government, uh, sp and specifically U.S. military and government. Um, I'm out everywhere. I'm either JBB or Jason Van Breckel, pretty much everywhere. Uh, Rancher Users is the Rancher Slack, and I'll give you an address for that later if you have any questions as you're diving into this stuff. So tonight is a quick and dirty introduction to Kubernetes with AKS and an opportunity for you all to ask questions and really some resources for you all to continue learning about Kubernetes because uh, I've been in the Kubernetes space now for about five years um, back in like the 1.0 days and I'm learning I'm still learning something new every day uh, so this is a scratch the surface learn enough to keep learning and, and gather some resources and ask any questions if you're already diving in so Kubernetes, it orchestrates containers, and that's it. That's all it does. Um, it takes the same technology that Docker uses. It's been around Linux since LXC, uh, Windows containers, and just organizes and throughout your mesh. That's its job, which may lead you to wonder, well, then why is it so complex? And really, there's three reasons for this. One is scale. Um, to handle the level of scale that Kubernetes handles, uh, it requires a very modular design that allows to go everything from one of the Raspberry Pi um, all the way up to giant cloud infrastructures with thousands of nodes. So uh, it is also complicated because of this reference API. And let me see if I can figure out how to switch my share as I go. Let's just share a whole window. Can I share a whole window? I can share a whole window. How awesome is that? All right, so I'm gonna move this over here. And this is the reference API. And this reference API changes uh, essentially um, every three months. So you have everything from how to work with workloads to services, to configs, to metadata. Yes, to understand Kubernetes very well, you have to know all of these various things. So you, like, what, what is Kubernetes? Like, why, why, do, why would I use it? So Kubernetes allows you to get uh, a significant ROI on your application deployment. Uh, so traditionally, in a, you know, in a DevOps mindset, you might use CI/CD uh, to continuously deploy applications into infrastructure. Um, some things be Maven, some things be .NET, some things be VB6 because you have old stuff lying around. Um, the container, is, the, the first thing that you get from the container um, is you get, a, you get a single unit of deployment and scale. So that, that container that container looks the same regardless of what's running in it and can be deployed anywhere within your infrastructure. Kubernetes allows you to allows the machine, the computer to organize that for you. So essentially you take your infrastructure and you stamp it with metadata, maybe geographic metadata, maybe machine type metadata, operating system metadata, uh, PII, PHI, things of that nature. And Kubernetes makes decisions on where your workloads go. So it allows you to, you know, bin pack things a lot tighter uh, and really get the most for your infrastructure dollar. And, and you know, as Kubernetes has 
has matured, um, you now have the opportunity to use Kubernetes, and it, it, Kubernetes everywhere. So from the cloud down even to, into the end of the vehicle. And so the projects that, that I'm experiencing now at DoD is seeking to put Kubernetes in the fighter jet and Kubernetes in the satellite. Those things are actually you know, happening as we speak. Mm. Cool. So, and let's talk about what Kubernetes is physically speaking, because sometimes it's easy to talk about what makes a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so this specific document is called the Cloud Control Manager, and it's nice because it has a high level design of what Kubernetes looks like. And there are essentially either two or three node types, depending on how you have your Kubernetes formed. Uh, you have your Kubernetes, your Kubernetes nodes. These are also called worker nodes or minion nodes. The vocabulary has changed a little over the years. Um, so you'll hear worker, minion, um, and just node used interchangeably. This is where all your work ends up. So it has kubelet and kube proxy, and those have two different jobs. Kubelet's job is basically to talk to Docker or to talk to your under, underlying container engine, whether that be Docker or Docker for Windows or Container D or whatever else you're, you're running. Kube proxy, it's a load balancer internal to Kubernetes that helps it that helps you know packets flow throughout uh, from the outside world into your workloads. So that's node type one. Uh, node type two, and these could be this uh, could be one or two types really, is your control plane nodes. Uh, oftentimes you'll see the etcd here. This etcd is your high speed key value store started by CoreOS, now Red Hat, and then donated to CNCF. Uh, that's your database. So it's much like a, a memcached or um, if you used uh, what's the one I'm thinking of, Fred Symbol. I'll remember later. Um, but yeah, high speed key value store, highly distributed such your etcd nodes, which can also be part of your Kubernetes control plane nodes. And you'll hear them referred to as the control plane nodes um, or master nodes, depending on the age of your documentation. And these all have sub processes um, that do the organization for Kubernetes. So you have your kube API server, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a REST API server. Everything Kubernetes talks to that kube API server. So whether you're using the Kubernetes CLI or you're using like Rancher, or you're using something else that you know, or you're using the Azure portal at some in some way, shape, or form. They're talking to the Kubernetes API server. There's lots of ways for securing this beyond the scope of today, but just know that everything you're talking to is essentially a REST API, and it's quite literally a REST API. So if I went down to Pod, which we'll talk about what Pods are later, um, they actually have a definition in YAML or JSON. So so this is this actually this actually is part of that REST API here um, at its core. And then here you have this special thing called the Cloud Control Manager. This is the thing in our world that attaches to Azure. So if this thing is misconfigured or fat fingered or not working properly, you can't get Azure storage and you can't get you know new nodes spun up on your behalf and you can't get load balancers or DNS uh, through the various subsystems of Kubernetes. Uh, this doesn't have to be turned on. And a matter of fact, if you do AKS, it's turned on. But if you were to install Kubernetes some other way, you may not even have this turned on because you might be running you know, in an air-gapped environment or on a Raspberry Pi where you wouldn't need the Cloud Control Manager. It's just extra cycles. So any questions before I move on? No, so this is uh, this is now part of uh, space and satellite and uh, airplanes and everything else is, is going to be implementing this type of architecture. Absolutely. Now, this could be on one node. This could be on multiple nodes. So a lot of a lot of the de development environments that you see set up to run with Kubernetes and some of the stuff that I teach when I do uh, when I do um, uh, uh, Twitch and all of that, I'm doing single computer work, but it has all these components in it. So you know you could have one or many Kubernetes nodes, you could have one or many control plane nodes, and one or many etcd nodes, and there's right. you know various trade offs to the size. And the idea is to use uh, etcd instead of uh, a Cosmos or or might mango mongo or something like that so it is possible to use the databases there's actually a sub project that rancher has worked on called kine or uh kine is not etcd so that's right here and this allows you to run kubernetes on other databases so it's a it's a modular etcd shim that allow that allows you to use things like postgres mysql um you know, if you were really crazy, you could write a SQL Server version or Cosmos DB version uh, to, to you know, spend all kinds of money with Microsoft using Cosmos DB. But this is primarily for control, for the Kubernetes control. This is yep. Yeah, this is this is the this is the back end for Kubernetes. So nothing actually ever talks to the yeah. database. It all talks right, to okay. the APIs. All, all via the APIs. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Exactly. Got it. Okay. All right. So moving on. 
So let's talk about why should you care. Let's talk about developers and operators and, and how that works. So for developers, um, containerizing your applications. Having a, an application that's containerized, whether it's you know .NET Framework, .NET Standard, um, Maven, Node, the container the container abstracts out all those implementation details. It, it allows you essentially to package your binary and all of its dependencies in one modular package, and that package is isolated uh, from other application from other applications running on the same operating system by the container runtime. So unlike a, unlike a virtual machine where you're truly sandboxed from a security standpoint, um, the only sandboxing is that of the container the container runtime is enforcing. Various container runtimes enforce this in different ways to various levels of security. Um, to give you an example of the extremes, you have everything from uh, Docker running, you know, Docker running wide open with root access, which everything can talk to everything and is highly insecure all the way to uh, I'm running a Windows container in Hyper-V isolation mode. And there's actually a, a miniature VM that gets spun up and isolates that application from other applications. Um, breaking the monolith is another reason. I've talked a lot about breaking the monolith. This is some of the talks that are out there. Um, quite literally taking um, patterns. Uh, take, what is the pattern I was thinking of? I talk about it all the time and I'm blanking on it because my brain's tired. Um, but yeah, breaking off pieces of your monolith once a time. Oh yeah, the anti-corruption layer. The domain-driven design anti-corruption layer is great for breaking down an existing monolith into small uh, containerized pieces to build out microservices to essentially take your monolith and at one piece at a time, turn it into microservices until it's either too expensive to replace a piece um, or you just have this small piece out there that, you know, Maybe it's your, you know, maybe it's your DV3, you know, purchasing database that you can't get rid of because it's been around since 1985. Um, and if you were to touch it, you know, all hell breaks loose. And then it's the substrate. So just like developers know a little bit about Windows, a little bit about Linux, and a little bit about Azure, and a little bit about Oracle, and a little bit about micro, uh, SQL Server that are all substrate for their applications running, Kubernetes becomes that substrate. Um, and we're, like I said, we're seeing that all the way from the pie all the way up into the cloud. So having some Kubernetes knowledge is really, really helpful. For operators, well, they're the ones who are running it. They have to deal with the scale and there's no getting rid of Kubernetes. It's here to stay for better or for worse. And what do I mean by that? Well, it won. So looking here, uh, this is this is the uh, market and mind share of the various orchestrators um, between 2015 and 2017. That blue one is Kubernetes. I don't even remember what the yellow one and the red one are um, because they no, no no one cares about them anymore. Right. So when <laughs> you know when when the first version when I was teaching uh, you know Kubernetes at you know South Florida Code Camp four years ago or three years ago, or how long ago, there were multiple orchestrators that ACS supported, that being Kubernetes, um, Mesosphere, and Docker Swarm. Oh, Docker Swarm is all but dead. It got bought by, um, it got bought by uh, Mirantis. Um, Mesosphere, they've, I mean, it's still around. It's actually a really nice orchestrator, uh, but the primary company, or uh, the primary company, Mesosphere, has now become D2IQ. Uh, they're a Kubernetes consulting firm now. So that, that, that line has just had exponential growth since 2017, where you know, Kubernetes is it. And there's some other players out there in the container space, like Nomad, for example. I think Nomad's a really nice piece of technology. Um, but where the enterprise dollars are is, is on Kubernetes. So whether we want to, well, Kubernetes, even though it's the most complicated and least user friendly for developers of all these technologies, it's not going anywhere. So at least understanding it the same way that we understand Linux and Windows is quite valuable. And we can see, uh, and th th these numbers are from a couple of years ago. You can see lots of lots of firms and not just Google are working on Kubernetes full time. And one of the frustrations that Google has is that they they, they release Kubernetes and go go lying onto the universe and weren't able to monetize it effectively enough fast enough. So you're not, so you're not seeing you know, Red Hat and IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and, and you know and, um, um, Amazon all eating pieces of that Kubernetes pie and, and Google having invested lots and lots of money into it uh, weren't able to monetize it effectively enough, which is you're seeing with their decision making now with donating Istio into not the CNCF and trying to control that a little bit more uh, than what has happened with Kubernetes. Who has some noise in the background? Uh, uh 
I was brushing my teeth. Sorry. <laughs> so let's talk about AKS. So Azure Kubernetes Service. It is highly available. It is a managed control plane. So going back to that, that document earlier, um, basically what I mean by managed control plane is all the stuff over here on the left is managed by Microsoft and not your problem. This is really cool because it means you don't have to worry about these. And even then you're getting some management of those as well. So it's a managed control plane and it's backed by AKS engine. It uh, in and of itself an open source project um, as to how this works. You can actually take AKS engine and run it outside of Azure. Now, I've not gone as far as to do that in about a year and a half, because um, back in the early days of uh, SIG Windows, um, SIG is special interest group. All the pieces of Kubernetes are managed by one or more SIGs. So SIG Windows is a special interest group um, focused specifically upon building out the Windows container support. Um, the last company I was with before Rancher Apprenda was very, very heavily involved with that, along with Microsoft and Red Hat and Highway and, and, and a few of the companies. And they're still most of those people are still actively involved, even though Apprenda has gone away. Um, they you know they've maintained their their interest in that specific subproject. And, and when you know, VMware has bought everyone else, those VMware uh, employees are now working on open source projects as well and parts of the Kubernetes six. But AKS Engine, you know, this is uh, the underlying of of how you know, AKS works, and you can actually go in and play around with it and deploy it yourself if you're so you know, if you're so uh, engaged. I've actually done that. Like I said, I've done this before. It's really really cool. So do feel free to you know, feel free to check that out. But that's the underpinning of this. So even that in and of itself is open source. So why AKS? Well, it's like we've been talking about. Kubernetes is a complex beast. The more things that we don't have to worry about managing, the better. Especially as we're getting started. That's not to say you, your organization may not want to run its own Kubernetes someday or its own OpenShift cluster, um, but you know, that's going to you know that is an undertaking. That's a significant undertaking because you're going to have to you know hire professionals in running Kubernetes, just like if you're running Oracle. You know you hire the Oracle cult members. We we'll call it, we call those DBAs, and you pay them an arm and a leg to go do that. Kubernetes is no different. It's a complicated beast. There's lots of switches and bells and whistles and buttons you have to push to make it run well. So using something like AKS could help, but maybe not AKS. Uh, one of the reasons that you may not have run AKS before is their SLA. Now the upside is between when I gave this talk in March and now there's a new SLA. So the old SLA was, yeah, this thing's free and we will strive to attain uh, this 99.5% availability, which is not very good. Um, fortunately, everybody started using AKS and said, hey, Microsoft, you know, WTF, this doesn't make any sense. You want us to use this thing? So they said, okay, we'll now sell SLAs around it and we'll give it 99.9, .9, you know, uh, per availability zone. And the terms are a lot better. But up until late March, I was having this con I was having this conversation um, and actually having clients that would not that want it to use managed control plane but would not touch it. So there are other options. Like I said, I work for, I used to work for Rancher, so I talk about Rancher quite a bit. Um, it in itself is you know, if you're in a multi cluster scenario, you may want you know, a managed control plane. There are things besides Rancher. There's Convoy, which is closed source. There's OpenShift. Um, there's Platform Nine, uh, Supernova. There's lots of there's lots of managers out there um, that have very fe various features. Some are open source, some are not. Um, I'm always going to lean on the open source because I want you to pick up and play with something. Um, so that you know, before you're going to spend you know sixty or a hundred thousand or half a million dollars on a support contract, depending on the size of your organization. But if you're talking something like a hybrid cloud where you want Azure and e EKS and GKE, you know, maybe AKS is just part of that. Um, or if you want Windows features, uh, the various clouds handle Windows features so, so well. EKS was actually further along than AKS for a very long time. AKS has picked up. Um, it's actually come a long way uh, between when I gave this talk at uh, South Florida Developer Conference back in March and now. So. There are lots and lots of ways to create an AKS cluster, and we'll walk we'll walk we'll walk through the portal tonight. But understand that you can do this with, our, with ARM templates. You can do this with a CLI. Um, you could use this do this with something like Rancher, which talks to Kubernetes APIs and talks to the Azure APIs. Um, these two here are probably my favorite, Terraform and Pulumi. 
So Terraform uses a JSON-like language um, to define infrastructure. So that could be you know, defining everything from your nodes to your Kubernetes clusters to you know, your RBAC and things like that with nature. Pulumi takes Terraform's model and turns it into code. So the difference really here is um, Terraform uses HCL or its own language. Pulumi uses languages you know, like Go and C Sharp and, no, or, and JavaScript to define your infrastructure as code. So this is nice because you can unit test your infrastructure, which I think is kind of cool and crazy all at the same time. Um, these three links, all three are open source projects that you could touch right away. And if you want my slides afterwards, Dave, I'll make sure you get a copy of those to send out to the team. Sure. So let's create a cluster and then we'll talk about some of the pieces. Um, so I'm going to go out to Azure. If I can find the right, yeah, other, other, uh, over here, I have my link set up. So first things first, install the Azure CLI. There are things you'll need it for. Um, I just I just searched install Azure CLI and however you want to do it for whatever operating system. Um, I'm going to use Ubuntu. Uh, I'm using WSL2 with Ubuntu, and I would caution against using all the Windows tools because like command line completion doesn't work quite right, and there's some weirdness with command prompts between Windows and Linux. So if if you know, if if Mac is your thing, go use the Mac. Or if you're not afraid of using or you, you know, the Linux distros, WSL WSL with a Linux distro works really really nice, and that tends to be my my preferred way of doing that. So go ahead and install your Azure CLI, and you're going to want a kubectl, um, or it's the you know, kubectl or kubectl. Uh, the official pronunciation, because you'll hear this, is kubectl. You'll also hear the word kubectl. And really, the difference is the people who like kubectl credit unicorn stickers with that said kubectl, and you can't fight unicorn stickers no matter how hard you try. <laughs> right. So you'll want you know you'll want you'll want kubectl. You'll want uh, the Azure CLI. Those are two things you need. Two optional things if you're using a Linux a Linux background that I'm going to highly recommend. One is kubeps1, and its job is quite is quite literally. Uh, to put what what cluster you're in and what context in your command prompt, and this becomes really important at scale, because as you're as you're working against multiple clusters and maybe have access to a production cluster, then you know which cluster you're about to destroy when you run that delete command. So that's that I, I have that on every every prompt I use, um, and then the other one is uh, kubectx kubectx um, has two tools with it. One is kubectx and one is kube NS, and this just makes it easy to move between context and namespaces for a specific cluster. Um, a namespace is like a virtual cluster within a cluster. So when, if you look at the Kubernetes documentation, uh, when they describe namespaces, that's how they describe it, a cluster within a cluster. It is quite literally um, your role-based access control and your access to the cluster um, within the context of that namespace and all of, the con all of the things that you do are usually namespace constrained. Um, context, is the combination of a user, or sorry, a cluster, a user, and a namespace is considered a context. So when you switch back and forth between contexts, you could be switching back and forth between um, between different namespaces and different user IDs with the same cluster for different levels of access. So this is two pieces of vocabulary. Unfortunately, for anybody who's learned Docker, none of that vocabulary carries on the Kubernetes. It has its own giant set of APIs that all have their own uh, language and nomenclature. So we'll talk a little bit next about that, that kind of language and nomenclature, just enough to be dangerous. Because of those like 50 APIs I showed you, once you know about eight to 10 of them, you know enough to at least get started with Kubernetes. So creating clusters, let's create one of the AKS. We may poke around with it, we may, we may not. So um, just to give you an idea for what's available here, uh, I'm going to go, so I'm already in here, so I'm gonna add I'm going to add a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes service. Now, ACS is still in the in the in the portal, and it's called. I think it's also called a Kubernetes service or container service. It's still called container service. So don't confuse the two. Yeah. So did they get rid of it? I don't. See, no, I don't see it in here. So maybe they hit it or gotten rid of it. But understand that um, there was ACS as your container service, and that's not the same as AKS or Azure as your Kubernetes service. So when you're looking at tutorials and things, and if they're a little bit older, make sure you get the right one. Uh, name your cluster something that you like. Put it wherever you'd like. I'm gonna go put it in East US. 
East to West, I believe. And they create version. So unlike the enterprise world where we keep things like Windows 7 around way too long, Kubernetes updates once a quarter. And I think it's one of the more complicated things about Kubernetes is every quarter a new a minor release comes out. So and the and the community only agrees to support the latest release and the last two minor releases. So right now, let's see, uh, Kubernetes 118 is out. So that means the community has agreed to support, the CNCF has agreed to support 118, 117, and 116. That's about a year. This is also one of the other reasons to use, use a cloud provider like this because they will support things that have already fallen out of community support like 115 and 116. That being said, Upgrade early, upgrade often, because you'll have a more stable, uh, more secure, more reliable, and more feature-filled version of Kubernetes every version. So really, let some of the early adopters figure out what's broken, but upgrade early and often. Is it, it is it easy enough to upgrade? Is it depending depending on uh, de de depending on what service you're using? Yes. Uh, sure. Most of them are very easy, and they're really it's like take the drop down, change the number. It'll flush yeah. one node pool to another, and it will automatically move all of your applications within reason. Things get a little hairy when it comes to like persistent storage um, or trying to guarantee zero downtime. Some of the tools handle that better than others. I got it. Jason, I have a question as well. Yep. So you're saying it upgrades every quarter. When when, it, when you upgrade it every quarter or whatever your schedule is, mm -hmm. how, how how much breakage is there on typically i mean there's most upgrades uh you software doesn't break or the the vast majority of upgrades i've done either with um with aks where i'm swapping out node pools um or with rke which is rangers Kubernetes engine that i do you know, for do for you know, on-site deployments nowadays they're really smooth two years ago that was not the case things would you know things would fail to you know fail to move and you'd have you know applications go down and come back up now the cool thing is that Kubernetes is built to be eventually consistent, um, which means nothing has ever truly failed. It's just failed for now. So it usually means you need more resources or you need more storage. And then once you have what you need, Kubernetes will go along and go, oh, I can schedule that now. Good. And when it can't, you get events and log files at the wazoo. I'm talking more more specifically what the user develops, not, not what's internal oh. to Kubernetes. Oh, as far as the user development stuff? Uh, yeah. That's – that – having multiple versions of the same application running in parallel is a no-brainer in Kubernetes. Uh, the, the hard part is just making sure the, the, you're, you're routing your package properly. I, maybe I'm not articulating my question well enough. A user, a, a user updates Kubernetes. Okay. And now their application breaks. Yep. How often does that happen? That's pretty rare. That's rare. Yep. So okay. usually, usually what has happened is... Stuff doesn't get appreciated or... What what usually happens is as the, most of the most of these tools do some sort of rolling update scenario where they're updating a node at a time. So as the nodes are updating, the Kubernetes control plane may go down, but because of how the container technology works, usually the guest workloads keep on running. And then once the Kubernetes control plane comes back up, it just keeps on keeping on. So you know, generally outside of catastrophic node failure. Even a even a half run upgrade will still have your your workloads, your guest applications, your not Kubernetes stuff still running. Right, but I, I'm still focusing on the user application of the stuff they develop. The 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 that, user. The, that, you mean you mean the you mean the, the your company's applications running exactly. in Kubernetes inside exactly. the container? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Those those are not affected by the upgrade paths. They're yeah. they're yeah. they're running in their own containers. That while Kubernetes is managing and orchestrating, when the Kubernetes upgrade is happening, those containers just keep running. Okay. Well, that's actually that's actually not entirely true because when you do an upgrade, what it does is it has to create a new node in the new version and then shut down one of the old nodes in favor of the new node which means there is a short period of time when it will shut down your containers on that node that's going down and then bring them back up on the new node that's upgraded. Well, that's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of how you do your upgrade that goes into that. So my, my recommendation is usually I create a new node pool 
with the new version. I spin that up first. I then have replica sets of the application run both in the old infrastructure and the new infrastructure, and I set up my network routing to, to round robin between them. So then as the old stuff is coming down, the package is just being routed to the new stuff, and you have you hopefully have zero downtime. That's true. That could be done. And another th another thing you need to be careful with on updates on upgrades is if you have a limited subnet that you're using in Kubernetes in yes. Azure, what it actually does when it does the upgrades of the cluster is it creates an additional node that's the new version, and then shuts down the old one. Yep. once it's moved everything over. So that means that temporarily you have an additional node in your cluster, so you have to make sure you have enough IPs left in your IP range. Oh, that's that's, that's, that a, that's a great node. point. Uh, that, that, that is an excellent point. <laughs> um, yes, your IP addresses, your, your subnet, your IP address space is a commodity that has to be managed both for nodes and inter-cluster. So there are actually three subnets to play, and we'll talk about that in a little while when we get into the Kubernetes paradigms. But yeah, great point. And I think you'll, I think, I'm not sure, but I believe you have to also upgrade version by version. You can't upgrade from like, you know, 1.10 to 1.16. It, it depends. Uh, so it, it, the various providers support different upgrade paths. Like for example, uh, the Rancher Kubernetes engine, we don't care it quite it was it, you can go from you know 116 to 118 and it, it, it just keeps on keeping on keep, keeps on keeping on but so yeah, it handles it behind the scenes then probably exactly oh okay well I, it, I believe azure you have to do it actually i'm not sure if azure does that but i, I think in some cases you have to manually do it one by one but yeah that's good to know yeah i've, I've not done it in azure in a while so uh but that's the yeah, your mileage may vary so node pools this is a pool of a node of a certain type. So in this case, I only have a primary agent pool. These are my Linux nodes of a certain size. I could add other pools. I don't think I have enough resources in this account, but I could add other Linux and Windows that are different sizes, maybe different operating systems. So you can have you can have a heterogeneous cluster with various different shapes and sizes for your applications, um, or a more homogeneous cluster. Um, where everything is the same. And that's all going to depend on the workloads you want to run. Sorry, I just realized I canceled out of that. So you set up your size for your agent pool. Then you go into your node pools, create more if you want them, set up scale sets, which work just like scale sets any other place within, uh, within Azure. Authentication, you can do your own service principle or you can have it set one up for, for you. That service principle becomes the glue um, between Azure and Kubernetes. So when you look at that cloud, control, that cloud controller manager here, this is what the service principle is doing is this piece here. Too many windows. There we are. Encryption type, that's going to vary on what you want. Networking. It's however you want to configure it. Basic works for a lot of users. Advanced, if you really want to play around with your Kubernetes service address spaces and your DNS and you know mess around doc Docker, you can do that. There's no reason not to. And there's some really cool things the Azure Net does that is not supported by other uh, network policy plugins. Um, but if you're just getting started, I would recommend going basic um, and either going none or Calico. So network policy is another set of APIs in Kubernetes called network policy API. So unlike the world where you're creating, you know, big Excel sheets full of firewall rules that some operator then has to figure out, you're actually creating network policy firewall as code, um, where you're basically using metadata on the applications to determine uh, the packet flow that is allowed for applications and various microservices. What's what's Calico? Uh, Calico is one of the container network interface plugins. So CNI or Container Network Interface um, is the you know just like you know it's 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 like a W three C spec. Yeah. specific to container networking. So okay. Azure Net and Calico are two CNI plugins. Calico's, uh, Calico's nice because um, it, one, it's open source, and two, it has some really cool enterprise feed level plugins that you could purchase from Tigera that do really cool things. The Azure Net, the Azure Net's nice because Azure Net um, natively speaks Windows and Linux in ways that Calico does not. So I'll keep no in for now. And then application routing, this allows you to set up DNS names for various application endpoints. And this is an Azure-centric feature. Um, there are ways of doing this without Azure, 
Um, I'm just going to set up no, uh, only because I don't want to have any side effects going on that, that I'm just not aware of off the top of my head. Um, and then you can also integrate with other Azure things like their container registry um, and Azure monitoring for your containers as well. Um, or you may use like a third party uh, monitor like uh, like uh, you know, Grafana um, or an Elk Stacks along those lines. But then we'll just review and create. And we'll see what I screwed up because it'll yell at me. Hmm. And then I'm just going to let it create. Now I have a pre-baked one in case you want to jump in. But while that's creating, let's talk about some of these uh, raised concepts. Um, the first is the pod. So this example here, I've got two containers running in a pod. Uh, this is Nginx. This is Redis. This is another key value store. Um, containers with a pod are co-scheduled which is just a fancy word for they're always in the same node. They share a network namespace, as in Linux namespace, um, and a file system. So in between this container and this container, they can talk to each other over local host. Um, they, they can see the same file system. So that pod is your isolation mechanism between containers. That is your, and that's your smallest you know, unit of deployment at scale. It has, its, like everything we look at, it has its own API. So when I, this, you know, this is quite literally the YAML definition of a pod, and it defines what the name of it is, what container image it has, maybe, a, maybe, a, and maybe a command with some arguments, or not. Um, you say, does, does this, uh, was all this YAML, or you, you had mentioned JSON as well? It's it's interchangeable. The okay. most of the time, you're most of the time a human, you know, humans read, tend to read YAML better, machines right. tend to read it's, JSON better. It seems to be where people are going with a lot of these. Yeah. Exactly, and you're not generally going to create pods on your own. You're going to create some sort of uh, some sort of controller, like one right. of these that we'll talk about momentarily. So, pods' job is really container lifecycle. That's the pods' only job is to handle container lifecycle. So that's abstraction one. The next abstraction that you don't generally create on your own is a replica set. So whereas the pods' job is to deal. Um, with what goes in, you know, which containers go in and running and lifecycle and, and you know handling you know container death and things of that nature. The replica set just with count. So this replica set represents essentially 12 of that pod. And its job is to always maintain 12 of that pod. So let's say I'm walking to the data center with my trusty Pepsi Zero Sugar and I spill it on a server. And the server goes out. Um, and and th that server is no longer available. The replica set, as long as there are resources available, We'll make sure those those twelve get scheduled. So a big part of the of the, of the Kubernetes control of uh, controller um, is to make sure that scheduling happens. So now, if for some reason there aren't enough, uh, there's not enough resources, it'll yell a lot at you. It will attempt to do so. It'll use priority rules to preempt certain things, um, but at the end of the day, it will it will keep trying, uh, you know, until it succeeds. And I have I've had I've witnessed this happen more than once. It wasn't actually coffee, but uh, um, quite literally a screw loose. I was down in actually I was down in Florida um, at a at a at one of the big giant amusement parks down there, and we came to do a demo of Rancher and Kubernetes for this for this team, and we, they almost turned us away because a screw was loose in their HVAC system. So they got you know yay big about an inch inch long. The HVAC technician used the wrong screw, and it caused the entire data center to overheat. Well, wow. yeah, it cascaded everything, not just their Kubernetes clusters, uh, but their phone systems, their Wi-Fi. They were completely down inside the office that day. It was not a fun day wow. for them. Wow. I, I, ended up demo, I ended up demoing Kubernetes and Rancher from the tethering from my cell phone. Yeah. Huh. Um, so next abstraction. And this is the one that you, know, you tend to start with is the deployment. So whereas the pod's job is container lifecycle, and the replica sets job is count of these of these pods. The deployment's job is the life cycle of the replica sets. So let's take this application, this pod, for example. This pod is my V1 of my pod. And let's say I have like a zero day or I've made some changes to my pod and I want to push my upgrade. Um, I can push a change the deployment YAML, push it into Kubernetes, and all of a sudden it will do a rolling update from V2 or from V1 to V2 until everything's V2. The rules for how this happens are adjustable. The default is I get one one new V2 and I spin down one V1. Now I can flush it all, like flush all my V1s out and spin all my V1s twos up at the same time. Um, I could do it in the opposite order where I spin all the V2s up at one time and all the V1s down. The thing we have to think about as developers is this situation. 
the APIs that we develop that are exposed by the pods that we create and the microservices we create have to be flexible enough so that you know, we know that if we're flushing out 10,000 microservices from V1 to V2, that there's going to be some time where we may have a situation where we have both running at the same time. And um, the deployment mechanism will actually will save revision history, I think, back to 10 by default and can go even further. So if you're running GitOps or a CIDC system where every code check is a potential deployment change, you have the ability to be flushing this stuff constantly and let the orchestrator do its job. It's it's why Amazon can you know can spin up ten thousand deployments a day and not even feel it because they use a technology they don't use Kubernetes per se but they use a similar methodology for deploying applications and pieces of applications having you know having things targeted to subsets of users throughout the day their, mar their marketing team is allowed to you know is can, has is constantly building out software Google AdWords team is constantly building software and constantly pushing new new pods so that you know you'll buy more from them. That's that's deployments in a nutshell. Like I said, it has rollback capability. So we've talked about how things get deployed. And, and so we've gone from how things get deployed, but we haven't talked about how you talk to them. And that's where services come in. This is our next level of, of abstraction. This abstraction is an abstraction over the networking layer. Everything we're talking about doesn't actually exist. It's implemented under the covers as IP tables or IPVS or some combination of them. And it's all the routing rules for how traffic is from outside the cluster into the cluster and into the parts of the clusters that you don't have to think about deployment as a developer and Kubernetes is just doing its job. So services have a couple of features with them. They have a DNS entry inside of Kubernetes. So every service has a DNS entry that's understood by a, a, a program called Core DNS. Now, if you're using older Kubernetes, you may have kubeDNS, but core DNS is much, much better. Every Kubernetes cluster that you're running has a copy of core DNS. The one we just spun up has a copy of core DNS running that keeps a DNS entry for every service. The service has it gives you a consistent endpoint for group of pods, and there are different types for different needs. These are three here. There are like, I think there are five or six of them. Maybe be seven now. But the first one you think about is node port. So when I create a node port service, I create a node port service and I give it I give it a port number essentially above 32,000. It's like 32,000 to 35, 7, 27 or something like that. Um, it's configurable, but that's the defaults. So no matter which node I hit, as long as I hit it on that port, it'll talk to that service. So it, to look at a service definition in YAML, let's see, it's service, no, where it is under networking, there it is, service API here. So to look at an example of a service, this is a good one. So this actually, let's make that a little bit larger for a fairly blind people like myself. Mm. I'm with you. All right, where did that go? Ingress service. So it, it says, I'm gonna take traffic um, from a port and send it to a target port in the in the container. So in this case, I'm going to listen on uh, this one doesn't have this one actually doesn't have a this one doesn't have a um, a node port on it. So um, but yeah, every so I'm going to listen on 80, and everything that hits me on 80, I'm going to send it to the container also at 80. There's more complicated scenarios, but this is actually a pretty common scenario. And then there's a selector, and that selector is key value pairs. And the selector is the only way that the service knows which pod it's going to talk to. The pods have labels, the services have selectors, and service selectors are just queries on those labels. So this specific node port, the client, or maybe a load balancer, will hit the service. Let's say this one over here. There are no pods running. Well, because I've created this service and the service has selectors, it will route traffic from this node over to this node. And over to this node, it will actually load balance. It's part of what Kube Proxy does. So that, that's the node port's job is to basically map a port on the node to a set of a set of pods based on their labels. So what's in the pod does not matter. Um, you could have multiple different types of pods with the same labels, and services will route traffic to them all the same. So I could actually have V1 and V2 of these pods running at the same time and like 12 other things that all speak the same API being serviced by the same node port service. It's really just an abstraction yeah. of IP tables. Nice. So load balancer. Load balancers are special 
because they require that the cloud does something. So you, so if you don't have this setup, you can't build load balancers. So you need some sort of cloud control manager to be able to create public IPs or private IPs to create load balancers on your behalf. So if you were to look at the inside of a load balancer service, it would have some public IP that they go into the cluster and then they would also have a node port associated with it that was created by Kubernetes. So from the outside world, it looks like this. It actually creates a in Azure, it creates an Azure load balancer. And then the back end for the Azure load balancer is one of these. So the Azure load balancer creates a service back end, the service back end talks to a node port, the node port talks to the pod. This is the more complicated stuff of just getting stuff running Kubernetes that makes everybody's eyes bleed. It's just you need to know enough of it to be dangerous so you can actually talk to the things running Kubernetes. Then, okay, the, the, other, the other ones here that I didn't talk about is cluster IP. Cluster IP is just in the cluster. So if I create a cluster IP service, I can have one service talk to another service inside the cluster, but nothing from the outside world. Um, there's also external external name, which is quite literally a class A, a DNS flip. It takes an X, it takes an internal um, DNS name inside of Kubernetes, this thing here, and you give it an external DNS name. It's actually really good for consuming uh, services um, like databases, for example. So if I have an Oracle database or a SQL Server cluster outside of Kubernetes, I might use an external name to set that up. That's a really common uh, way to do that. And there's some other ones in the APIs that have various semantics in services uh, like the endpoint, endpoint slice that have specific use cases um, within Kubernetes that go well beyond what we're going to talk about today. So config maps and secrets. So config maps are interesting because they uh, the, the difference between a config map and a, and a secret is base64 encoding. So secrets are not very secret. They're not secret at all. They're base64 <laughs> encoded. They're encrypted. So uh, the, instead of encryption, you have encryption. <laughs> So, and I stole that from a speaker who did a talk called Base64 um, is not encryption. And he talks all about how secrets work and how to properly encrypt them in Kubernetes. Uh, so this is from FOSDEM 2019. Uh, Seth here uh, works for Google, or at least he did at the time he wrote this and he goes to a deep dive into how Kubernetes secrets work and how they should be configured if you're going to secure them properly that most most people don't go that far so you know on day one so if they don't understand what they're getting into they leave their secrets wide open or just base 64 and encode it to so understand there's more that goes into encrypting secrets than just creating the secret right but secrets are how you separate the configuration of your application from the binary itself it's exposed in the pod as environmental var environmental variables or files in local storage so a really common pattern for .NET would be to take your app configure your web config and create a config map from that. Or your database connection string becomes a secret. So it decouples your storage from your configuration. It actually goes back to a methodology called 12 factor. Um, so for those unfamiliar, uh, a 12 factor app, um, really today we would just call this a microservice, but this was, this was developed by the Heroku team to talk about how to develop properly architect software as a service. It's a great online book. But one, it talks about you know, things that should seem obvious to us, like one code base tracked in revision control and not throwing your code in an S3 bucket. I say that out loud because I've even within the last couple of years found teams not using, you know, uh, source safe or, you know, team foundation or CVS or PVCS or, you know, hopefully get or get um, the actually still storing code in file systems, which is really, really bad. X so, copy. <laughs> X, yes, X, yeah, X copy for the win. Um, so this, the the idea of storing configuration environment and separating your, your configuration, you know, from your from your run, really goes back to this this model for developing software as a service. And you could you could really take um, the twelve factor methodology and just call that microservices architecture for for building out SaaS. So that, that's well worth your time to go through and read that. It has the EPUB format. But that's where uh, the idea of config max and secrets really are informed. And they quite literally look like this. This might be a YAML for the for config map, um, where we have our dev, our QA, and our prod configs. And the keys are all the same. 
but the values are different based on dev or QA or prod. So this might be, this might actually be, you know, web.config with the whole web config file in here and app.config with the whole app config file in here. Um, you know, my DB connection string in a secret, which looks just like the config map, like I said, except it's encoded um, with my database configuration string. That's quite literally, it's just, you know, um, in that case, exposed into your application um, as either an environment variable or a file. And what I would recommend, I, what I actually recommend is if you're going to use environment variables, don't have your code looking for the environment variable. Have the uh, environment variable pass as a command line argument when your application starts. That way, you have a single point of entry for all of your external dependencies as far as the maps and secrets go. Any questions before I move on? All right. So we've talked about layer four. So this is our, our networking. Here, this is all our, sorry, this is all layer four stuff. IP, um, you know, TCP IP, UDP IP, it's all our layer four. What I mean by layer four is just the OSI model. So for, for those who did not go get uh, comp sci degrees or don't have a back, uh, background in networking, um, OSI is dealing with the layers of how communication systems talk to each other. So when we talk about layer one, uh, we're talking about you know bits over the wire over the ether. When we talk about layer seven, uh, we're talking about the application. So take HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, um, SSH all belong to this layer. Um, the bits over the wire and how those happen and how those signals are processed are way all down here. Three, when we see layer four, we're usually saying layer three and four. So TCP and IP or UDP and IP, or if we're old school Novell networks, we're talking IPX, SPX, that would also be layer three, four. What about layer seven? I'm talking quite a little about HTTP, HTTPS, and, and, and the translation of a URL route to something back end. In this case, it raise a, in the world of services. So that's the ingress. This is how traffic from the outside world is routed into the cluster. There are lots of ways of doing this. Every cloud provider has their, essentially their own ingress controller. So there are two pieces of the ingress controller. There's the ingress controller itself, which is a reverse proxy that knows how to do this thing. And there's the ingress rule, which is the API object that we're talking about here. So when you hear Nginx or HAProxy or ELBs or the Azure Load Balancer, they are acting as ingress controllers on behalf of the Kubernetes cluster to take a route, a layer seven HTTP route and send it to a backend layer four service. And it works quite literally like this. Um, we take our address, it goes through the ingress controller, which knows how to do Kubernetes ingress rules. That then in turn goes which backend service to create. That could be a node port, that could be a load balancer, that could be a cluster IP. Just a little bit of danger going from layer seven ingress rule to layer four uh, cluster IPs, because it doesn't always work depending on the cloud. So. Azure supports it, but like Google Cloud Platform will not let you do a cluster, a ingress controller to a cluster IP. And the spec around that from the Kubernetes standpoint is gray enough to not really give a hard and fast rule. But just understand that when you go from route to service, you're flipping from layer seven to layer four, and then everything else works the same as we talked about with layer four services. So how will this screw me up? Um, the, the, the most common areas this will screw, screw you up is either um, you configure your your you know your URL wrong, or you fat figure your service name. So this actually the service backend um, has the, is actually called out by name. So this is one of the areas. This is one of the few areas is not a label selector combination. You have to call it the service by name. And the biggest area where people screw this up is this ingress rule, and this service have to be defined in the same Kubernetes namespace. So even though the ingress controller may be you know, in its own namespace, it is cluster wide, the rule for it is scoped within a namespace and that service has to exist within the same namespace. Hmm. So that's, okay. that's where most people screw this up. And ingresses themselves are limited. That's why you see the the. That's why you see technologies like Istio and Linkerd out there to do more complex things and more complex um, authentication models like MTLS, for example, that can't be done by the ingress alone. And so the whole you know the whole kit and caboodle from an AKS standpoint, as far as how traffic goes from the outside world, might look a little bit like this. So you you know. First thing first is you go and you hit you, you have your app, you, know, you have your URL and you hit DNS. 
Now, with that application routing turned on, it uses another subproject called external DNS. And what external DNS does, it takes your ingress rules and your services and turns them into DNS rules in Azure. Um, actually, I, there, there's probably a presentation out there that I've done on external DNS with Azure before, probably two, like two years ago. But essentially, that HTTP routing internalizes that. So when I create things in the cluster, it creates Azure DNS rules on my behalf. So the request then goes through a, a front end load balancer that could have been created by a Kubernetes load balancer service. So I created the Kubernetes load balancer service and the Kubernetes cloud control manager in turn creates an Azure load balancer here that is then reflected here. The back end for that load balancer is likely a set of ingress controllers. So ingress controllers are pods that are listening on 80 and 443, and their job is to do is to, is to handle all the HTTP traffic for your entire cluster. And so they have rules, and those rules are either is URL to service by name. So if the URL doesn't match anything we know about, there's this idea of what's called a default backend that, that handles 404. And its only job is to handle 404. And if you don't give it a default backend, it'll just tell you no default backend, 404. Then depending on the URL, it will then route to a service based on its name. Remember, this is just an IP tables rule. The service doesn't exist anywhere. It's, it's, a, it's an abstraction on top of IP tables and IPVS to route packets from one node to another within your Kubernetes cluster. So this service has a selector that defines a key and value pair. That selector will match key and value labels on each individual pod. And will define, you know, which, uh, which port the service listens on and which port inside the container traffic will be sent to. That's Kubernetes routing in a nutshell. And that's, and this is what, this is the part of Kubernetes that messes everybody up who's just getting started because they don't understand that it's not just deploying containers, it's routing the networking so you can actually talk to it. Right. So any questions about this big picture? I always end with the slide because it did, it, it, it glues together everything we just talked about. Remember ingress controllers, that's the message. <laughs> yes. So the AKS cluster we created, and we got a couple, we got a couple of more minutes. So I'm gonna actually connect to this cluster and show you what comes with your cluster that and how that relates to the pieces that we've already talked about. So I've already gone ahead and so I can I'll minimize that. And we'll leave those up for now. So I've already gone ahead and installed the Azure CLI in my machine on my machine, so I can talk to Azure directly. I'm going to need that to get the configuration for the Kubernetes cluster, so I can talk to it. And I'm going to need Kube, and I'm going to need Kube Control to do that as well. I've already installed um, Kube PS1, so I know which cluster I'm talking to. And I have Kube CTX and Kube NS already installed, so I can easily move between namespaces um, and context here within Kubernetes. So I'm going to actually. Um, use one of these clusters I've created. Let's see what we have here. So I have this, I actually pre-cooked one in case things went awry. But here's the one we just created. And the cool thing is every like month, something new is happening here. So the last time I gave this presentation, this namespaces wasn't here. Um, and these workloads aren't here. So this, this, so this, these are actually, this is actually a look into the cluster uh, from the Azure UI talking to the Kubernetes API. So the, the Azure portal um, is speaking to this Kubernetes API server to figure out what's going on inside here. Now, it seems to be really slow, which is probably why it's in preview. Anything? Oh, good. So we can see here workloads already you know, by our namespace. By default, we get this default namespace that's just created so you can start playing around with your cluster. I have no idea what Kube node lease is. That's actually new to me. I don't know what mm. that is. I'm going to have to look that up. Kube public, this is for public things. Nobody uses Kube public. Feel free to, de to, to, to delete it. I don't know anyone who uses Kube public. And then Kube system, if you mess with things in Kube system, you're going to blow up your cluster, <laughs> guaranteed. So Kubernetes dashboard, funny story about the Kubernetes dashboard is a friend actually helped build the Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, we we had that we gave we gave a UX designer uh, to Google to work on this project together. And then when they released the dashboard, they then hire the, the UX designer out from under us and stop working on the dashboard. So one of the things Rancher fills in is Rancher is the dashboard that everybody wishes they had for Kubernetes because the Kubernetes dashboard didn't go anywhere after it was developed. But mm -hmm. it is a nice UI way to see your cluster. Uh, metric scraper. 
So inside of Kubernetes, you have ways of scraping metrics. You so this one is specific to Azure. This one is specific to Kubernetes. Metric server is is basically exposing metrics about the pods, exposing metrics about the nodes, exposing metrics about the services, um, and making them publicly available. The metric scraper is talking to metric server and building out really cool dashboards here in Azure for you. So when I go into this diagnostic stuff down here, that's being filled in by what's going on here in the dashboard metric scraper. Um, I have no idea what tunnel front the OMSA should do. I have to I'd have to look them up. And then core DNS and core DNS autoscaler are actually really important. This is your DNS inside your Kubernetes cluster, and it needs an autoscaler because you can choke this thing to death. The bigger... so, so are all these things in the control plane? These are on the control plane. Yeah. Actually, no, they aren't running on the control plane. They're running the worker nodes. They are they are needed by Kubernetes to work properly. Um, actually, the, the control plane usually runs in either processes outside of Kubernetes or can run in, in, in containers as well. Okay. But you don't usually see the control plane stuff from within Kubernetes. You can. It's just considered an anti-pattern to try to run, run right. Kubernetes in Kubernetes. Right, right. But it, it's totally a thing that you can try to do and, and trip over your own feet and fall on your face. I've been there back in my days of running Kubernetes by hand um, a long, long time ago, which really a long, long time ago is like five years ago. It's really not that long time. So, that so these, are like, these are like management nodes, essentially. Yeah, they, 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 well, they, 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 this, these are management deployments. Right. Deployments so they could be, of, they could be of, running of somewhere nodes. within the agent, within the worker nodes of this Kubernetes okay. cluster. And if we look at the pods, okay, the, po the deployments contain pods. Right. And then the replica sets of the plex of the deployments manage replica sets that contain pods. Right. <laughs> or daemon sets, which we didn't talk about. Um, daemon set is just a, it is a type of controller that means put one on every node. So if I have three nodes, I get three Ku proxies. So this is interesting. They're actually used. They're actually deploying Ku proxy within Kubernetes. That's a that's that's a new pattern for AKS that well they weren't doing that before. So how do we connect to this? Well, that's this is where the Azure CLI comes in. So I'm going to go into my handy dandy terminal so, window. So the Azure the Azure clusters aren't too much different than this even. No, no, they're, 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 they're all the same kind of kind they're of idea. All, if, if it speaks Kubernetes API and it passes the uh, CNCF conformance test, we can talk to it through kube control. And that 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 certification process. So every Kubernetes cluster has to every Kubernetes distribution has to go through CNCF uh, Kubernetes certification. No, no, I was saying that uh, Azure clusters, you know, the the, the machine clusters, yeah. were, are similar. It's not Kubernetes, but it's it's. Oh, oh yeah, it's it's too. very it's a very similar paradigm, absolutely. Yeah. So let's go. So I've already got like so you see my Kube, my QPS one running. I don't not connected to anything right now. So I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go into my Azure CLI. I'm gonna do an AZ AKS, and we have all our subcommands for this. So we so if you don't have the CLI, you can actually install it from here and give it version and things of that nature. Um, I'm actually going to um, grab. I'm actually going to grab the. Um, I don't need the CLI. I need the configuration. So I'm going to, I need, I need, I need, I need the credentials. I'm going to do get credentials, AZ, AKS, get credentials. And you need essentially two things. I need the name of the cluster and I need the resource groups. The resource group is, this is why I have this up in the other one. The resource group is, I named the same thing for good reason. And I need the name of the cluster, and I think it's I think it's N. You'll see how wrong how wrong I am as soon as I hit mm -hmm. enter. Oh, look at that! Oh my! Oh, it expired. I gotta log in. Quick, everybody, don't look at his keyboard. <laughs> so, device login. And code, and one of the million of, the, of these that I have to log into. So now, yeah, now I'm back in, and now let's see what I did wrong besides not logging in. All right, 
So what just happened is it merged the current context into home, my home directory dot kube dot config. There are many ways of doing kube config, and I would recommend having multiple kube config files and not squeezing everything into config. Um, and then using uh, an environment variable called kube config. I might even have one here to manage that. So right now, I'm just gonna I'm gonna unset that. So by default. It will first look here for this variable, and then it will look for this file. So I'm going to unset that variable, and you can see immediately my kubeps one goes, oh, we're going to talk to this file, and we're looking at the floor that we're in the default namespace. So if I do a kube ns, I get a list of all the namespaces here that we saw earlier in the UI. And if I do a kubectx, I can move between them. So you see here my two, my two, oh, I have another context. So K3 is a tool I use, so um, you can ignore that for now. I only have, in this case, my one user that I'm going to use is this uh, JVB inside of FLA.net. This is quite really the JVB user inside the FLA.net context, which is some combination um, of cluster user ID. So let's look at what that actually looks like. Oh, nasty. All right. So you have multiple clusters. In this case, this is my K3D one. We don't want that one. We want our Florida and one. So um, we have our our cluster with our certificate authority data, which has information about the Azure AKS cluster was created um, with a name. And we see a context here is a combination of a cluster a, and a user. And sometimes it will actually have a namespace in there as well. If it doesn't have a namespace, it just defaults to default. But this is this is the archaic th way that Kubernetes talks to its you know this the, the CLI knows to talk to Kubernetes mm -hmm. is how this works. Everything is YAML, even the config file is YAML. So everything else happens for kubectl, and kubectl is essentially um, kubectl uh, and then verb and noun. It has its own help, so I can explain what the resources do. So if I do a kubectl explain pod. Code. Pod, and it gives us an idea of what this is, how it works, what the various fields are in it. But let's actually get something. So if I do a kubectl get, I do get pod. Oh, I'm in the default namespace. There are no pods here. Let's go into kube system and muck around in there. Again, we're going to use kubeNS. We're going to go into our kube system. And we're now in kube system. So went and it changed the context. If I were to look at my config file, my config file has changed. So it changed this context around, so I'm in a different namespace, so my active namespace in kube system, which is good that I know that I'm in kube system, so I don't go around mucking around and destroying things because I can easily destroy my cluster now that I'm in kube system. And now I can see all the pods and some, and some information about them. And I can see all of the various ingress rules, which I don't think I have any, nope, none. And I can see my services. And you can see here, I have services here for that metric server endpoint we talked about for the Kubernetes dashboard um, and for other things running here. Now, if let's see, let's do, let's, let's see if this works right. So if I do a kubectl proxy, oh, that was weird. And so now if I do, actually that's not really gonna help me. What I just did was if I do kubectl proxy, that's now my Kubernetes API. Let's see, I don't think I have anything running on 001 here. And we can see here, this is the Kubernetes API. So all those API endpoints we were looking at in the documentation are exposed here. So if I wanted like, if I want to work on my own CI CD that talks directly to the Kubernetes API because I'm a crazy person who does everything by curl, I have the ability to do that right here. But Kube Proxy also has the ability <coughs> to uh, proxy other things. If I want, to, for, for example, to proxy out um, a, to expose a specific service, I could also do that with Kube Proxy as well to talk to things like the dashboard. And there's some other really cool tools out there that, that, make, this pro, pro, that, that make this a lot easier. So if I wanted to proxy, you know, instead of the API port, if I want to you know, expose like the cluster port, um, you know, I could do that as well. But if we look at if we look at let's let's look at how these the service attaches to the pod. That's all of my services. Let's look specifically at kubeDNS because kubeDNS is a good one to look at. So if I do a kubectl describe, and it's 
DNS, we can see here more information. So we have this, this looks very similar to the YAML. We know this is a cluster IP service. It's only available within the cluster. Um, it itself has labels on it. We don't really care about these labels for our purposes. Um, the relevant cassette does though. Or, and then it has, it's listening on 53 because it is a DNS server after all. And it targets 53 inside of it, you know, inside of the pods to talk to. And it knows the pods it's going to talk to by its selector. Where's my selector? I don't see my selector. I see, oh, there's my selector. So every pod that has a label with the key of Kate's app and a value of kube DNS, that's where that data will be, that's where that data will go. So anything that talks to one of these nodes on port 53, and you can see the endpoints right here, if it hits port 53, it's going to route to pods that have this label on them. And now, we, now since I know this is DNS and we can cheat, we can, see, look at the, we can actually look at that pod. I want to describe pod, or let's get the pod first. And I want to grab, let's say this one, for example. Now, these two will have the same labels on them. I know that because we, we, you know, we, we cheated. We know we're talking to DNS. But if I do a kubectl and describe that, we can see information about these pods here. And the important thing here is the labels. So if we look, where's volumes? Uh, where is that? Oh, it's up here. So we can see how the labels have this kube API and kube, this, this key value pair of app DNS. That is the only reason the service knows to route to those pods. Mm. It's all via that selector, that selector uh, label combination. Mm. Everything else is, you know, either related to the underlying um, you know, Docker infrastructure or is information about environment variables specific to that, to what that thing is doing under inside the pod um, and other information about what's going on as far as Kubernetes is concerned, which is things here like the, the you know, requests and resources, which go well beyond what we're talking about today. But everything, you know, everything you're going to do, it, at least to start with, is going to be through this kubectl interface to create you know, various containers. But let me give you the next steps as far as, as where to go once you have access to a cluster with kubectl running. And I'll give you, and I'll give you some, my, some of the easy buttons I've learned over the years. Um, the first one is called Azure Draft. So Azure Draft is meant for the inner loop of a developer. Now, it's it's still an active development, but it's not very active. I've actually taught draft um, at South Florida at Code Camp. Oh, it's been archived. This is uh. recent. Oh no, that makes me sad. This wasn't this wasn't archived up until very recently. Um, but draft's job was to handle um, basically create the Docker, you know, create the Docker container, create all the baseline YAML for you, and create the Helm chart. So I'm not sure where Microsoft is going with this project because as early as late last year, when I had a conversation with some of the Microsoft developers on this, they were still working on this. So I don't know what's happened between then and now. I'm going to have to find out. Um, the yeah, other I, one- I would say they put it in something else. Yeah, that's exactly what they did. Yeah. I, we just, I just don't know what yet. All um, those people are working somewhere else. So, well, they've been spending their time on Helm. So Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes, and Helm is to Kubernetes as Docker is to container images, or Docker Hub, for example. So those are your next two steps as far as packaging and deploying. I would say it would be draft, or maybe not anymore, but Helm, um, as far as getting your applications in. So most of the applications you, that you get from, from to start with are already out there in Helm packages that you can go and look at hub.helm.sh, or to the public things and actually just go pick your chart. So if you wanted to work with, um, I bet there's a SQL Server chart out here. Maybe, you, incubator? Okay, no, these are other databases. Interesting, I thought there was, I thought there was a SQL Server chart out there. Let's look one more, let's look in one more. No, all kinds of DBs, interesting. They're used to, either they got rid of it or I'm just not, yeah, my, my search foo is not very good. But to get an idea of what a Helm chart looks like, it really is just a lot more YAML, but YAML with fill in the blanks. So let's grab mm -hmm. which one of these will be fairly simple. Redis is not that complicated if we're all grab Mongos. And if we look at, you know, how it's deployed, it will deal you know, this. Th there are all kinds of ways of ingesting. These are the instructions for ingesting. 
and Helm is just another command line utility to help you do CICD for your applications. Um, next steps, because I've thrown a lot at you and you still can't do a whole lot. So I'm going to recommend, and I, uh, I'll send links to you, Dave, as far as the group goes, go through the certified range for operator level one. This is hands-on three to five hours of free training on getting Kubernetes up and running and working with kubectl and getting applications running. Um, well, I, that, that was worth what uh, Dave charges for this uh, meeting right away. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, that's I, amazing, Jason. That's amazing. So, so um, feel free to go through this. Um, I, this is not a waste of your time. I promise you that. I helped build out this curriculum. So um, when I was with Rachel Labs, me and a bunch of other field engineers and professional services people, um, we put together this curriculum. I didn't do the videos for this curriculum, but a lot of the tutorials that you would, the walkthroughs are things that I spent weeks building. <laughs> wow. So this is, and this is hands-on, um, you know, working against, you know, nodes that you create that we have with some options. So feel free to go through that. And it's just academy.rancher.com. Yeah, thanks. So that was that, that, I said, that is your next. Now that is using RKE or Rancher Kareis engine, but because the, you know, because the Kareis API is Kareis API, you could use a lot of things that are here for RKE. As far as you know, when you're actually working with Kubernetes and securing Kubernetes, you could do that against AKS if you wanted to. But this this stuff also works on prem, which is nice about RKE yeah. is it works on prem and in the cloud. Um, so that's that that is like my next step as somebody who you know who is who is developer oriented and, and, and you know all the stuff I do with you know with uh, Kubernetes I do from the developer's perspective because I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. As a developer, I hate Kubernetes. The user experience for the developer just sucks. It's terrible. The tools are getting better. But because Kubernetes is aimed at operators and cloud providers and people putting things with Raspberry Pis, it's built for the operator. It's built with the operator in mind. The developer is generally a consumer, but the problem is, is that that line, it gets more and more blurred as we, as we are become more devops -y as a culture. So I can so you saying you're going to work on a plural site course? <laughs> I would love to, and I've tried to get into plural site on more yeah. than one occasion, and I've just ran into brick wall after brick wall. But yeah. I would be more than happy to do yeah. a plural site in anything in the Kubernetes space. Yeah, I mean, Jason, isn't plural site owned by Microsoft? Or Are they now? Isn't it owned? Is it? No, no. plural site was owned by LinkedIn, and LinkedIn's owned by Microsoft. No, 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 no. No, owned by owned by Aaron Skinner. Oh my, <clears throat> Lynda.com was Bob. <laughs> Lynda.com is what you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, Jason, you you should you know enough people. You should be able to get into plural. I, I I I may try. I may try again. I, I yeah. But yeah, well, they have a, they have a whole training thing and all that. But uh, yeah, the the other the other great free resource uh, because they uh, they have a paid version as well. Um, but Linux Academy. Um, Linux Academy has one of the better online training systems out there. They got bought by a cloud guru. Um, I have, you know, I have some good friends there, but they regularly release for free, um, a subset of their, of their, um, of their courses. And oftentimes Kubernetes is mixed in there. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cloud guru. Now I still remember it as Linux Academy before the merger, lots of good, good stuff out there. Um, I, at least once every two weeks, but hopefully more often, but I, I promised, I promised rancher, I would still continue to do this every two weeks. At least I do the ranch cast. This is just youtube.com mm -hmm. or twitch.tv slash the ranch cast. And this is rancher and Kubernetes things from a developer perspective. So I did one this morning and I tried to install K3S on my machine and I failed miserably. I know now why I failed miserably and that's what I'll be doing next week. <laughs> I'm uh, posting a link to uh, Kubernetes learning and training from Azure, okay. their, their learning path. Awesome. And so I, yeah, so if you want more here, uh, lots of free, lots of free stuff that I've done personally. And also um, Rancher has done a lot of free training content. I'll, and I'll point you out to a couple of them that are really good. Um, 
and they're actually a little bit of the older stuff. One is the networking masterclass. So if you <laughs> really want to understand everything on how packet flow works, this um, June 2018 Kubernetes networking masterclass is well worth the, the the two hours that you spend doing it. This is this is actually part of what Rancher uses to train field engineers. So if you're hired by Rancher Labs, part of the training is to actually go through this masterclass. Maybe you could paste a link for that into the chat. Sure can. Here, let's just copy the location. Uh, okay, I don't want. Uh, we can dismiss yeah. it. Where's my chat? Where's my chat? Up oh, there it is. Right. Oh, this there one. Is. Yeah. So yeah. So definitely. This is this is Teams training as well. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then the other one, I, I didn't even talk about storage because storage is a big mess in Kubernetes. Um, but I actually gave this online meetup. You can ignore everything on Longhorn that was talked about here, but the storage fundamentals are still sound. I remember Longhorn from a long time ago. It's it's well, there was Microsoft Longhorn. Yeah, and yeah. there's years ago, CNCN, yeah. CNCF Longhorn. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, those are those those I would say are definitely the next steps as far as getting to know Kubernetes hands on and understanding yeah. things that go beyond just the the one oh one here is how you talk um, to Kubernetes from AKS. That's great. So before I let you all go this evening, what questions do you have for me? And it could be something we covered, something we haven't covered. Um, you know, anything, anything in this realm of Kubernetes plus developers plus Azure. You know, I, I, I keep, I still keep up on .NET, even though I'm not developing in it every day anymore. I'm actually doing more Go code now. But you know, I still, I still watch Jeff Fritz do, uh, do his stuff yeah. on Blazor almost every day. Yeah. On on his Twitch. On his Twitch. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I haven't been over there for a while. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, for, I forgot my the Twitch as well, Ranch Cast. Yeah, be, before we go to questions, I just wanted to mention, I I was doing the um, <clears throat> Rancher course on uh, and not because I came to AWS and I'm overwhelmed by that. I will be returning to it. It was a very good class, even if you don't know certain things. You know, I I had to go out and learn, you know, like you know how to do SSH, secure SSH connections with passing uh, things on and stuff. So it's really good for, so, um, you know, they're teaching you the Kubernetes and the Rancher and, uh, and it's a good environment. And I, I really enjoyed the class and I think the, the uh, presentations are, are engaging as well. Yeah, well I, so I would that. highly recommend it out. And, and they have a Slack channel for, for, so you can search for, for help and, and all that. And, you know, of course, obviously ask questions. I see uh, Esteban's yeah. asking a question. Yep, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Is there a repo or basic application that you recommend for deploying it indicates and getting the hands on? What is a simple, you know what? There is actually a, uh, there's a Rancher Hello World application. And I think it's part of this, this certified operator training. It's actually a really good demo application because it has <coughs> a deployment. It has a, an Nginx pod that, that's running a website. And it sets up the it sets up the service and the ingress as well. Let me see. It's Rancher Hello World. Ah, what is that called though? Is it part of this course though? It is part of the course, and I think it's actually I think it's this actual image that ends up running. Right. Hello World. I think that's the one. I'm, I, I'll send the link. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm like ninety percent sure. And that's a that's a really good just base demo application. Um, I'd also recommend, and he works for Rancher Labs, but this is his private channel. Um, is Adrian Coins TV, hmm. and Adrian does a lot of really good Kubernetes um, and Rancher content and every day. He does coffee in cloud native where he talks about the latest that's going on in the cloud native community. Wow. Dave, yeah, he, is that Dwight's uh, brother, Dwight Coins? <laughs> no. Maybe. Sorry, Jason, there's a very famous guy over here named uh, very similar. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Dwight Goins, you probably know him. I, I have not I've not met him, but I'll look I'll look him up. <laughs> you 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 have. If not, I have? You've seen okay. him. Okay. Yeah, Best guy at, at, at every code camp. You, you can't miss him. All right. 
I, I will look him up because I'm sure if he was dressed well, he was he's noticeable. Done. Yeah. He dresses very well. Because as you can tell, this is this is this is my workout fit. <laughs> lucky man, lucky man. All right. Any other questions? All right. If uh, no more questions, I'm going to turn off the recording. And so, thank you very much, uh, Jason, and everybody for coming. By the way, Jason, I hear I, I was doing a little something, but that was spectacular, and I appreciate very much that Dave, you're recording this. <laughs> you I'm were going up on the floor of that. that uh, yeah, I'm going to go to yeah, take that course. That sounds like a good thing to do. So familiar actually, with it. If you have questions as you're going through the course, uh, the the Rancher user Slack, you can sign up at slack.rancher.io. And I believe there is a Rancher Academy channel in here. Let me look up and see if there, I believe there is one. Academy. Yeah, there, there is one. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, so there, you know, if you have questions, you run into bugs. Uh, this Academy channel in Rancher's users, um, there are people out there from Rancher Labs like Adrian, you should look familiar, um, who is out there, who is out there answering questions about it. Um, I, I'm out there occasionally, less often nowadays since moving to Rancher Federal, um, but a lot of the authors of the courseware, the tutorials, uh, hang out out there as well. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, uh, Jason. I'm glad we were able to reschedule this and get you back on. So that was good. Yeah, I th thank yeah. you for having me. And see, so, yeah, sorry about last time. They yeah, we can't start it. He wanted to be not quite dead yet. <laughs> He's still Jason, kicking. The, the team had to suffer through a little presentation I have always in the back of my my uh, slab yeah. deck and all that. So yeah. thank yeah. goodness well, you came this time. Damien's never at a loss for words unless he's muted. <laughs> <laughs> or presentations. Yeah. All right. See y'all. Well, if you if you want to follow up some time on applications, uh, by all means, let me know. I'd be more than happy to do another one, you know, further on down the line. Excellent. Um, and hopefully, I will see you all, you know, at another developer conference. Hopefully, one of these days. Yeah. One of these days. I just started going to start to go to the Philly Code Camps, and then we got shut down. So. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> go figure. All right. See you later. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Dave, for bringing this on. Thanks.